Hello and welcome to Gotham Sound TV. Uh, my name's Peter Schneider. I am here with Andy Munitz from Sony Professional Audio. Hi, uh, Andy. Hey there, how are you? All right. Um, I, asked so I asked Andy to come in uh, to talk about Sony Wireless because uh, I was working on the frequency coordination team at the debates and, uh, you know, part of our workflow was to um, log what the news crews were using and then assign frequencies and I saw more Sony Wireless than I had ever seen. Um, you know, like a substantial percentage of the crews were using Sony Wireless and they worked fine, they worked great. Um, I mean, in some cases, and we'll get into this a little bit later, mm -hmm. um, even turning down the digital power uh, on the transmission, on the transmitter exactly. to the minimum, um, we still have phenomenal range. And at Hofstra, we were dealing with 300 plus UHF frequencies. Wow. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I really, uh, I, I know they work. Um, you know, and I'd go up to the crews later and I'd say, any issues? And they'd say no. And um, yeah, I mean, it was it was exciting for me to see, and, and I'm excited to be able to represent the brand and sell the brand. Terrific. And, um, so yeah, um, so uh, I guess we'll start by uh, talking. You know, there's a lot of stuff on the table, as yeah. you all can see. Um, let's sort of start to um, divide and conquer, and I guess we'll concentrate our presentation on two main tiers. Correct. Um, and before we get into that even, I wonder if we could do like a kind of 30,000 foot overview sure. of Sony's sure. um, history in, in wireless audio and, and, and how did they start? For sure. First of all, um, hello everybody and, and, and uh, I do appreciate the fact that you're tuning in today and uh, thanks very much to Gotham and to you guys. Uh, Sony, uh, many people don't even know the name Sony uh, start, uh, started out um, as a, a Latin word, sonus, for sound, when Sony was first uh, created in post-war uh, Japan in early 1950s. Uh, the very first product that the founders wanted to make, believe it or not, was an electric rice cooker, but it failed in prototype form. So then they said, let's make a something better. Let's make a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and we can market it to schools so that performers, musicians could hear their performances back. And so that was their very first product in about 1950. It was called the G-Type Reel-to-Reel -reel Tape Recorder. But if you think about it, when you sell a tape recorder, it needs an input device. So we supplied a microphone that we made. So we've literally been in the microphone business since about 1950. We got into wireless microphones in about 1960. And it started out with the first transistor you know, transmitter and the receiver was a big tube affair and things like that. And uh, really an interesting thing. I have you know some old uh, uh, ads you know from magazines that are really kind of uh, interesting from those days. Do you remember the, the frequency that the I operated? certainly don't. I, I, I should go look that uh -huh. up. But you, you're right. And um, you know to that point, um, every generation of wireless microphone that we have introduced to the market has been a little better and, and more features and things like that. And, and we actually um, were first to market with an awful lot of features that people just sort of take for granted in today's world. The first to, you know, put a, an LCD display on something, to put battery timers, to have tunable frequencies where you didn't have crystal locked and you were, you know, out in the field and you had noise, you were a little hose unless you had a backup system. So we had a tunable VHF system early on uh -huh. and uh, a lot of channels that could operate at the same time and you know intermod free and all that kind of stuff so we've been trying to uh, advance the state of the art for for you know since we've been in this business and I think that what we have here today and that I hopefully will get to tell you about is it will will show that we've tried to carry this technology forward, and uh, I think we've got some interesting things. Yeah, um, let let's get into it. So uh, two tiers, like we like we mentioned, 
Um, let's start with the first tier, which is, um, it's not quite fair to say it's an analog system. What, help me understand it. it. It's called UWPD, uh, UHF Wireless Package. We started uh, with packaged wireless, you know, 12, 13 years ago with our first generation of UWP. And um, we have enhanced its functionality and, and made it, you know, more robust physically and things like that and better displays and menus. And we are now on our third generation, which is called UWPD. And the D stands for Digital Signal Processing. Uh -huh. So as probably most people are aware, analog wireless uses a companding scheme. And it's that companding scheme that can, you know, kind of uh, give you less than optimal performance. So by now handling that companding scheme in the digital domain, we can be extremely accurate about it. We can take out the kind of variances in component quality that might normally go into that. And um, we can have, you know, real mirror images in the transmitter versus the receiver. And um, with the goal of making analog wireless sound very good and, uh, and trying to hold on to as much of the transient response of your signal as possible and not have a companion scheme kind of mush out the sharp transients, if you will. Got so it. that's one of the, the overall benefits of UWPD. So what, what are some of the components within UWPD? Sure. So within UWPD, um, we actually, you know, again, sell it as a packet system. Mm -hmm. If you want to maybe do the overhead here, we could just have a peek at these. So we have our body pack transmitter here. It's a UTX, UT, T for transmitter, B for body pack, O3 for third generation. And a simple package comes then with a portable receiver, the URX, R for receiver, P for portable, O3 for third generation. And this package comes with a, you know, a complete set, everything that you really need, including a lavalier microphone and the various connection cables and belt sure. clips and everything. Let's take a look at, um, so it's, it's a uh, stereo mini is the input on the transmitter? On this guy, yes. But as a matter of fact, we offer a, an, a, a, a different model, which is called the UTX B03, just like this one, but it says HR on it. And that stands for Hiroshi Connector. So you do have your choice of, sorry, there we go, of the locking mini or of a four-pin Hiroshi connector for maybe a more substantial connector that might hold up to a little bit more abuse and strain relief and things like that. Sure. And just a word about the locking connector. Mm -hmm. um, it, it looks exactly like this, the um, connector you might find on a Sennheiser G3 or G2 series, mm -hmm. um, but is not pin compatible. Exactly, wired a little bit differently. Yeah. And obviously having, um, you know, we make various lavaliers in, in Sony land, so we offer many of these in both connector configurations as well. But a lav does come included in what's called our UWPD-11 package, which is those two guys there. Um, we also offer a UWPD-16 package, which adds to that kit a portable plug-on transmitter. Mm -hmm. And that is right there. And that guy is um, uh, obviously um, interesting <laughs> and can be used for a lot of different applications from pure broadcast to, you know, whatever, boom pole situations. But now, it also it, offers 48 volt phantom power. I was just going to say, it really could be used on a boom pole because it does offer full exactly. 48. Exactly. And um, price wise, um, you know, per channel, it's about five to seven hundred dollars per channel in this in this range. Exactly. Um, you know, obviously for all of this stuff, um, email call go on online on our website, and, and we'll put together exact packages. And I also want to mention it. Your transmitter will work with any manufacturer's LAV, just like other wireless. Yeah, it's just you make sure you have the right connectivity. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. But. That alone doesn't really tell the story, if I could. Um, one of the, the important things, perhaps one of the most important things about any wireless system is reliability of signal. And to that degree, uh, most people are familiar with the concept of diversity reception. Many people might not be aware that there's different ways of designing that diversity reception. Um, the way we use it is, the way we design it in this situation, is that there are two independent tuners inside of this receiver unit. They're both tuned to the transmitter frequency. And then the two tuners each have their own antenna. And then there is a little, what's called a comparator circuit, looking between those two receiver antenna combos, saying 
at that instant, which one of you two is better? And it will do an audio switch back and forth. So you're always on the cleanest. There are other methods which are called antenna only diversity, where you may have a single tuner, but double tuners, and the switch happens between the antenna signal. We don't think it is as potentially as robust. And then there's called adaptive diversity, where you have a single tuner and a single receiver antenna, and then maybe the audio cable that feeds into the camera is asked to also act like a second antenna, but obviously a different looking antenna than your main antenna. All of these have a goal of fitting into a very small portable package and maintaining great battery life, you know, good eight hours out of a pair of AA batteries. It's hard to do that, but we have been able to do that. And so we try to offer here the highest quality form or design of diversity circuitry to make sure that you don't get dropouts and also keep the battery life going. Um, beyond that, yes. Well, I was going to say, um, let's let's talk about um, frequency band splits. Sure. Um, and and maybe we can get into a little bit of operational stuff like scanning for free frequency. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, what are the frequency band splits? So, what we try to do at Sony is offer as few packages as possible, but that means each package needs to have the widest possible bandwidth coverage. So if you realize that we're living in a world of unused UHF TV channels, white spaces, from TV channel 14 up to 51, what we do is we split that roughly into thirds. So we have a 14 block that goes from 14 to 25. That is 12 UHF TV channels covering 72 megahertz. And then we have a 30 block, and that goes from 30 up to 41. And then we have a 42 version, which goes from 42 to 51. Functionally, they're all identical. It's really just the bandwidth that we cover. So in the 14 block, which is again 14 to 25, we have the ability to even have these things um, scan and broadcast down to 25 kilohertz spacing. So this pair can tune in up to 2,772 different frequencies. And that's, you know, important certainly uh, where there may be a frequency coordinator on site and says you have to get to this certain frequency I'm assigning you. Yeah, no, for, for us it was a dream to be able mm. to uh, have that sort of um, wide split of uh, frequencies. Mm. Um, yeah, that the, the, um, the ability to, to go into that fine of a tuning mode was, was absolutely, absolutely great with combined with the band split. It's exactly. a huge band split. And we cover this same kind of frequency uh, split or division, if you will, um, across not only the analog with DSP wireless system that we're talking about now, the UWPD, but also in our, our complete digital wireless package, the DWX series that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Great. But it's the exact same thing, and they're all compatible in the same place in the same time with you know, various groups and things like that. Fantastic. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and let's do, um, uh, you know, I, I get to my location. I'm a, I'm a typical yes. sound person, camera person, um, uh, uh, you know, camera person made to do sound for Great. people's work. Uh, I need to scan for free frequency. Exactly. Let's do the above thing. Mm -hmm. If we notice that on, there we go. If you notice that there's an infrared port there and there's an infrared port there and they kind of face each other as long as they're within a couple of, feet of each other, we're simply going to tell the receiver, which looks at the outside world, go and find me the quietest frequency. And you may be able to notice here, oh, let me just get it, there we go, that both of these have a set button on the left and a plus or minus or up down button on the right. Same thing for the transmitter. So the up down button scrolls through various menus and the top menu is this home, you know, that gives you your grouping number, your TV channel 34, and 04 uh, out of nominally 47 different frequencies that happen there, plus your frequency number, plus your RF strength for both your A and B tuner. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if that is. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but the idea is if we go now down two menus, one, two, to the auto set button, appropriately named, and we hold down the set button, until it flashes the word yes, and we hit it again to select yes. It is now going to scan 188 frequencies in about 12 seconds and actually show you the background noise that it found. 
And on the transmitter, it wakes it up via, R, via infrared, and you just change that to say yes, and you hit the set button. And now we got full bars, and we're set. And they're both set to the same thing. And if you notice, over here on the A and B at the top of those things, as I move the, tr oops, sorry, as I move the transmitter around, uh -huh. it will switch back and forth from A to B which is a good thing, because it's saying I'm now looking at the A tuner, I'm now looking at the B tuner, and the diversity circuitry is working. So um, that's as simple as it is to find open and the best frequencies. You can obviously set in groups yeah. that if you have multi-system operation and you want to know that you've got l as low intermod distortion between various systems, that's all built into the system, into the, into the chip, so you don't have to worry about, you know, my dog ate my homework and I left the manual at the shop. That's great. And I should also add that you have a bunch of training videos online, which we'll exactly. link to um, from, our, from this video to your training videos. I just wanted folks to get a, a sense of how simple it was to Good. operate. Good. Um, we should talk about the other receivers in this line. Sure. Um, yeah, I think moving up in this form factor is the dual receiver. Um, Ooh, this is a biggie. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is big news for us. Uh, you know, I've been with Sony since 1984, and uh, with our wireless, I've been going, when are we going to have a small camera mount portable wireless receiver that's dual channel? And they go, not yet, not yet, not yet. And finally, the circuitry and the manufacturability is here. And we've just introduced about two months ago this new little portable two-channel receiver. It is barely bigger and thicker than the, here maybe down here, you yeah. can see it is not much thicker than the single-channel version. It does have some very unique capabilities. The most important thing, obviously, is it, is it can look at channel one and it can tune in channel one. It has channel two and you can control and go through all the menus for channel two. Mm -hmm. And it has a, um, something we'll get to in a minute, and then it has an overview that allows you to look at both channel one and channel two at a glance and look at the battery life and the RF level and the audio level. That said, um, there are again some very unique things. So if I go to just look at channel one and I go down in the menu, at the bottom of this menu is something called a sign output. In other words, if you have a wireless channel coming into channel one and you've got a two-channel output that may feed into a mixer, into a camera, whatever, must wireless channel one only go out channel one? No, this menu allows you to say, I want it to go out channel one, I want it to go out channel two, or I want it to go out both simultaneously. And, you know, for people in TV land, if you're watching, you know, uh, your TV and you got a pair of speakers, um, this sort of puts the voice down the middle and matches it up with your video. I also imagine this to be used with a lot of so-called one-man band uh, type shooting. Right. Um, and where they don't necessarily want to have to manipulate cables, they just want to mm. send one channel to both outputs, and then when they get into a situation where uh, they have two wireless or an on-camera mic, they mm. can easily switch it and manipulate it at the menu. Exactly. And obviously the same thing for channel two. You can, using the onboard mixer, route it out either side. But here's where we get into something Unexpected. If you look at the top panel of this, we obviously have our main outputs here, and the receiver comes with a pair of mini to XLR connectors. It also comes with a pair of minis, a sort of a Y cable going from dual minis down to one stereo mini for those DSLR type applications. We have a headphone jack, so you can, with a headphone level, so you can always monitor here versus through a mixer, through a camera, or whatever, if you want to make sure that signal is clear and strong between the transmitters and the receivers, you can listen right here and say that if I'm hearing something, that's clean, that's not the problem. It may be further down the line. But look at this guy here. It says, let me see, mic input. That is a weird place to have a microphone input. And it is a weird place, but it does a really cool thing. It allows you to mix in additional wired microphone sources right at the receiver position. It may be on a camera, it may be wherever. 
what might be an application? Well, if you're a cameraman, for example, and you are not only the producer and the director and the cameraman, you may also be the interviewer. But generally, if you're behind the camera, your audio sort of gets captured off mic and it's not that usable or that good. I mean, people can hear you, it's just, it sounds wrong. Now you can hook up a lavalier microphone directly into here, and from behind the camera, you can be recorded in full fidelity. So that can go live broadcast to air, or it can get used in full post-production. Sorry, I was touching the mic. But um, that's an interesting application there. However, this little microphone input happens to also be a stereo input. A stereo input would allow us to take something like this little stereo, we can go back to the overhead, this little stereo plug-in power mic that we used to supply uh, years ago with our mm -hmm. mini disc recorders, but it's still <laughs> available in the, consumer, in the Sony line, but there are other manufacturers, and that allows us to now capture stereo ambience right at the receiver and through the menu that says external mic select, we turn it on obviously, and, but you can adjust the input level of that stereo, plus or minus 12 dB, to just be there and support the two, you know, maybe up to two wireless channels. So that means you can now capture stereo ambience plus talent. And, you know, a simple, you know, obvious application would be you're at a, a, a sporting event and, you know, I'm here and we're here live at the game, but instead of the person at home just hearing that in mono, they're hearing the crowd of 80,000 people in the stands, or live breaking news where you have fire trucks whipping back and forth, or you're a, a, you know, a church, wedding, a church wedding videographer, and now in addition to the bride uh, or the groom having a lav to capture the wedding vows, back at the camera, you can capture the the, uh, the sound, the reverberant sound of the organ inside the church in stereo. Now, can you assign that mic input to either of the outputs? Yeah, you can. Okay, great. So, so that can go either to output one, output two, or to oh, both, both, hard That's left and right. Fantastic. Right, plus level, obviously, yes. Yeah, um, and does it, is there s any compromise compared to the single channel receiver in terms of the RF um, reception? Is it still? I would say yes. In, in, in this guy, obviously we're packing two complete tuner sections, each with their own antenna for true double tuner diversity. In this receiver, when you, you know, you do have individual, here we go back down here, we do have individual power switches for channel one and channel two so that if you're only using it as a single channel receiver, you're not wasting battery life on a second power, mm -hmm. a second circuit. And if you only power on one receiver, you've got true double tuner diversity. Both tuners are assigned there. If you do put on the second one, now it's antenna diversity for um, each channel. Huh. So that's okay. the way it is to be. Fair enough. Yeah. Right. But look at the size we've managed to have with a pair of AA batteries. And so that's kind of cool. And before we move on to the slot receivers, because yes. you guys make a slot receiver exactly. in this in this, in this hybrid yeah. uh, digital series as well, yeah. um, there are some hot shoe mounts ah, that I yeah. think are interesting. So um, first of all, we didn't really mention, but this is all metal construction. It's solid. Yeah. It's got a great fit and finish. You know, it's nice to hold them and go, yeah, I like that. It's you know, feels good and a nice display, and it's all you know, backlit and so on and so forth. But Traditionally, people will hook up the receivers with an analog mini jack to XLR connector. Sony being both a camera manufacturer as well as an audio manufacturer, the two engineering groups obviously can talk to each other and they developed something called the multi-interface shoe or MI shoe. Cameras generally have a, a shoe on top for just cold shoeing something on or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, over the last couple of years we've been introducing on all of our new models this MI or multi-interface shoe. And it exists on our camera line starting at our Alpha DSLR series nice. all the way up to our professional DI cameras which is our you know pro camcorders but right stopping at the full shoulder cam with a did you know the slot and receiver however what that means is is that if you have this receiver let's actually go to the overshot and in addition to the micro USB jack that all of these components have 
Um, that, by the way, is for once in a blue moon blowing in new firmware. But also, you can put in nickel metal hydride batteries into these guys and just hook up your cell phone charger to this and just charge up those batteries with that jack. A very convenient feature <laughs> for the market that, they're, that this is meant for. Exactly. Really nice, really nice. But there's also this multi-pin connector, and that is the multi-interface or MI shoe connector. Now, that wouldn't so easily interface with uh, uh, the same shoe on a camera. So we offer this little sled. It's, you know, all of $60, $70 or whatever. And it's got the jack right there. So you take the receiver, you slide it on, you click it in, you tighten down the knob so the little pins don't wiggle. And now this connector here slides right onto your camera, so to speak. It's right under the hot shoe of the camera. So and if you're using a Sony camera, um, any of the models that we touched on, exactly, both audio Yes. And power. Yes. So audio goes down through the shoe directly into the camera, and at which point, either on a menu or on a hard switch on the side of the camera, you say, I want that to be assigned to channel one or channel two mm -hmm. or three or four, as it may be, depending on how many channels of audio are in the camera. But additionally, power can come from the camera's battery up and power the wireless receiver. So you don't need the batteries in the little battery connector. And believe it or not, that lightens this thing up a lot. And through a whole day of hand holding a camcorder, ergonomically, that makes the camera less front heavy. So that's kind of a unique capability. Now, we also, as we talked about, have the new dual channel receiver. And there is specifically a new dual channel MI shoe adapter. And you know, these shoes, have a, a funny name, a model name. They're called SMADP3 or a P3D. So if you're looking for one of those shoes and you're getting the receiver, make sure that you specifically get the two channel shoe and a single channel shoe for the single channel receiver. And but just out of yeah. curiosity, uh, does, do you guys offer just a dumb shoe or would you? It does, Ash, uh, good question. In the package when we supply you know, both of these or any of the packages, mm -hmm. it does come with a cold shoe Great. adapter Great. with you know, the appropriate belt clip springs and um, that's it, it's all, it's all there. And for those users that are using a more professional camera with the slot-in style, yes. um, you in this line offer a slot-in receiver. Exactly, at the same time we kind of introduced the two-channel portable receiver, we introduced a new two-channel portable receiver. And we'll talk about the case in a second. There we go. Yeah, there yeah we go. so this is now two channel. It's full double tuner diversity. Let's go to the top maybe. And so there's four tuner sections in here and a couple of comparator circuits and they obviously share the pair of antennas through an antenna divider. And then we can slot this receiver directly into the back of any of our shoulder cams. The interesting thing there is since this receiver is analog transmission with DSP processing at a transmitter, we come in with the uh, analog mic, excuse me, analog mic, go through a mic pre and then into an A to D converter. We then do our DSP based compounding. We go back through a D to A converter to make it back into analog. We use FM modulation. We transmit it to the receiver. At the receiver, we bring it in, and then we go through another A to D converter to bring it back into the digital domain, where we do the inverse you know, compounding scheme in the digital domain. And on this guy, we will go back D to A again to go into a camera. In this guy, however, if it's slotted into one of our cameras, we bypass that last D to A conversion process and we go direct digitally right into the camera, becomes part of the video file in the camera. And so that's kind of interesting. And it, it's a good opportunity right now to talk about um, the, the sleeve that you're in. Yeah, so this is a what's called a DWA F01D. It is really a bucket. It's a name that rolls right off the tongue, I know. But it's a digital wireless adapter, you know, and uh, it takes both our analog two channel receiver as well as our two digital receiver and it puts it into a bucket that is now battery operable. You get analog outputs, you get um, 
you get uh, AES EBU output, you get word sync in if you want this to be word sync slave to an external source. You have a jack which can be set for mic or phone level. You have a variable pot. You can even bypass the onboard little L series batteries and you can give it, you know, uh, nominally a 12 volt input. And, uh, and, you know, or there's another input on this side. And it allows for if you just want to have, you know, two channels out in the field and not do a whole thing. We even make a little leatherette case so you can hang it off your side and a strap and the whole thing. Amazing. And there's so. two versions of that uh, case, one with the battery and, and one. And one without. And here I've got two of these cases bolted together with the little, you know, adapter plate that comes with it. So you can sort of keep adding these buckets. And this bucket has the same kind of connectivity in terms of analog, you know, little Hiroshi to analog breakouts, mm -hmm. and they can be analog outputs, they can be AES outputs, you have word sync input, you can feed it with a 12 volt, you know, supply, and uh, Gotham was kind enough here to, to give us, you know, or let us set up with some additional little accessories that you, you know, might help in making a mixer bag out of this stuff. Uh, it's fantastic. So that, that brings us to the um, analog hybrid line, yes. um, the UR and UT line. Exactly. Um, it's a also good called the UWPD U, series. U, exactly. UWP yes. series. Um, it's a good moment to talk about uh, since you mentioned A to D and D to A stages. Yes. Do you know off the top of your head what the latencies are? I don't have it in my brain. All right, I don't we'll, want to we'll make We'll have that. We'll right. have that specs. Right. I have it on the digital stuff. I don't have it in the analog sure, stuff. Sure. But it's it's extremely low. Good. Um, we care an awful lot about latency. Yes. Yes. Good. Um, all right. So let's take a breath. Yes. Because um, as 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 wide as that uh, line was, that was just that one was half. <laughs> yes. That was just one half of of the Sony audio wireless line. Yes. Because we now have. Um, the digital line to talk about. Exactly. And what's, what series nice is that called? You're good at this. Well, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. right. Um, about 10 years ago, the componentry finally became available, and our engineers felt we could now develop true digital transmission wireless in a small portable package. It would have been one thing to just make it uh, in a studio package, but we try to do a whole family. Obviously, a large part of what we do at Sony is camera technology, and we sell lots to, you know, news crews and, you know, ENG and Hollywood for digital cinema and all those kind of things, as well as, you know, videographers and corporate and so on and so forth. But we wanted to be able to do a whole family of digital wireless transmission. So we developed something called the DWX series. And what is unique about the DWX series is that it is true digital transmission. Whether you're starting at a body pack or a plug-on transmitter or a, you know, handheld transmitter, uh, you know, microphone. And I think it's worth talking about what, what are some of the advantages of a true digital transmission? Absolutely. I would have to say uh, there's a few. The, the first one is ultimate sound quality. Since when you kind of go into your mic pre from an analog source and then you go through an A to D converter, now you're in the digital domain. You got bits. You got ones and zeros. We transmit bits, ones and zeros. We're still in the digital domain. We hit the receiver, it's still in the digital domain. If that's inside of a camera, it goes directly into the video file, it goes through post-production editing, it goes through transmission to the home, it's still digital. The only time and the very first time it goes back to the analog domain is at the D to A converters that are in front of the playback speakers. So literally so, from the actor or presenter's mouth to the speaker, those are the only two the analog only points. Two, the only two analog points. Yeah. Certainly, if you've got a digital mixer on set and you're feeding, you know, digital out, digital out of the rack receiver, you're staying digital. You know, mm -hmm. it can go and literally stay. But the, the benefit there is that since we are transmitting bits, a bit stream, there is no reason for a companding scheme. Companding isn't even part of this equation. So there's no chance for any audio artifact due to a companding scheme. And that, to me, is the real beauty of this. This stuff is 
clean as a whistle mm -hmm. and to my ears, and I've tried to do some careful testing, mm -hmm. identical to plugging in a mic with a cable. Yeah. So that's a huge benefit. Another smaller benefit of digital is you can do encryption. And encryption may be important if you're working on you know, big episodic TV, giant movies. I mean, you know, if you were, you know, uh, doing the new Star Wars feature and you didn't want paparazzi sitting around the corner from wherever your, your shoot is, listening in and learning the plot lines, um, that can save you a lot, a lot of hassle and, and a lot of embarrassment you, by getting that story out. Do you know, uh, because people ask sometimes, what level of encryption? Do you know the level of This encryption? is 128. 128 it bits, is. okay. And, but you can do one transmitter to one receiver or one transmitter to multiple receivers. They can all be on the same flavor and the same family. Uh -huh. And actually, uh, the White House has been using this digital wireless from us for many years because of the encryptability of it, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool. Yeah. So that's another, you know, arguably a smaller benefit of digital. Sonic, uh, sonically, it is very important. Um, I think also that uh, the amount of power that you need to cover the same range, the difference in the signal to noise of a digital bitstream versus background noise, there can be a much wider ratio of signal to noise and the receiver can still pick out the digital bitstream. So you don't have to have this crazy amount of power. So as a matter of fact, these go of a setting of, of power from 110 or 50 milliwatts. And people generally think, more is better, let me crank it up to 50. But that would be a mistake, especially if you're in a normal kind of 10, 15 foot distance thing. Right. Overdriving the input circuitry can actually harm your digital bitstream. So you should try to operate at 10 milliwatts. If you're, you know, 100 feet away or whatever, you're driving away in a car or something, by all means, put it on 50 milliwatts. But don't instantly think that it's, you know, the same, uh, it's always going to be better. And you can't exactly say that the power output on this is apples to oranges of the settings that you're used to in analog world. And let, while we're comparing to analog world, talk to me about the spectral efficiency of digital transmission. Ah, very good question. We do live in uh, uh, spectrum challenging times and it's mm -hmm. only going to get more so. If you have a, uh, actually earlier I mentioned that we you know, all operate in this, both of our systems operate in UHF 14 up to 51, and we kind of split the ranges into, uh, into three bands. Actually in this big receiver here, this one receiver can cover the entire range from 14 all the way up to 51. It can tune in 7,600 and something channels. Um, so that's, you know, interesting. Our body packs, our plug-ons, our transmitters, we all kind of put them into three ranges. That same, those same three ranges, the right. analogs. But us. a lot yep. of times you exist in a world where you have to have compatibility um, with analog wireless. They need to coexist in the same place and time. So we have groups that are built into the digital wireless that are analog compatible groups that will allow for low intermod. But in a purely digital transmission scheme, mm -hmm. intermod problems are minuscule, especially compared to analog land. And that means that we can fit many more channels into a given UHF TV channel white space. Where in analog land, on a UHF TV channel, we generally say you can fit eight wireless mic analog channels within there without intermod and they'll be mathematically pre-tested and all that stuff and they would not be evenly spaced as a matter of fact throughout that six megahertz wide TV channel. In digital land if all you have is digital microphones and digital wireless transmission you can actually fit 50 percent more channels in that given space so it is more spectrally efficient yeah. but what we are doing here is keeping, in that scheme, we are keeping the quality high. We are not reducing, you know, frequency response, any of that stuff. So, um, and that does bring up a point of codec. You know, we are definitely a digital scheme. So we go from the analog domain into the digital domain and then back out of it at some point. But the codecs that get used to go from analog to digital have to be designed. There are companies that make off-the-shelf codecs. And 
for anybody that has dealt with Sony on our broadcast video side, they're well aware that if anything, we're a Kodak company. You can almost blink and, oh, we got another Kodak, you know, for our video cameras, be it XD Cam or XAVC or AVCHD, all that kind of stuff. But we did not want to just use an off the shelf audio codec for this, so we designed our own. Because when you design a codec, you have to balance out two things that sort of play against each other. Latency versus how long you can take to do a higher quality conversion from either A to D or D to A. Right. The more complex the codec, the longer it takes to encode exactly. and decode. Exactly. And, and latency can be an issue. So we designed our own codec that was equivalent to 24-bit 48K quality with a latency of a max of about 3.4 milliseconds, which is, you know, me being only, you know, like mm -hmm. three feet or so away from you. We have, by the way, just introduced uh, our N-series versions, which is really our third generation of the DWX. And one of the benefits of that is you now have a choice of two additional codecs. So there are a lot of opera houses in Europe that love our digital wireless for the way it really sounds. But they wanted to have a codec um, that was even faster. A lot of times in performance, you will have on stage people with in-ear monitors, for example. And the, you know, uh, you know, just take this as an example. I'm a performer, I'm singing, my signal's going out to, you know, the receiver, which is going through the on-stage monitor board and then back out to a transmitter back to my in-ear monitors. And if that round trip is a little too long, the singer in their head, it just won't sound quite right. So having a very low latency is important. So in Codec 2, which is one of the new codec choices in the N-series version of DWX, we can now bring that down to a maximum of 1.5 millisecond, which has got to be an industry you know, kind wow. of leading point. So very, very fast in terms of that. And so what, what's the flip side of that coin? What, any compromise in that? No compromise in that, no. In, in, we have Codec 3, uh -huh. which adds an extra layer of error correction that gives you potentially, you know, it's not a spec, but you know, my sense is about 20 to 30 percent additional distance mm -hmm. of transmission. It could be important for a huge uh, film set, that would have to be a really big one, or for broadcast sports or things like that. And the trade-off there of that extra layer of, of, uh, of uh, error correction is you get out to about 4.5 milliseconds of, of latency. Again, not a really huge issue. Okay. Um, but our engineers at Sony are kind of always trying to think of unique things they could do that would enhance the usability of anything. You know, the question you originally started out with is, what are some of the benefits of digital? And this one that I'm going to tell you about is really kind of, I like it. It's really interesting and it can really help out. And that is remote controllability of a transmitter. Imagine you got this transmitter, it's a body pack, it's all wired into talent, they're ready to go live, they're doing their shoot, whatever it turns out to be, film, news, whatever it turns out. And you're the receiver, and you're listening, and um, you say, you know, I got to adjust their mic pregame. Mm -hmm. uh, I, oh, the wind just came up. I got to dial in a little low cut filter frequency. Um, you know, so wouldn't it be cool at a distance to be able to remote control all the settings on that transmitter? And that's what we do through a specific. Um, architecture that we call cross remote. Cross remote is is different from the transmission of the audio, which is arguably the most important thing to go from a transmitter to a receiver. That's job one. Um, by the way, since this is a digital transmission scheme, we can add additional metadata information from the transmitter and have it be embedded in the bitstream to go back to the receiver. So I can put in that embedded bitstream, um, what's my battery life? What is my uh, frequency, obviously? What's my, my, my power output? What is my low cut filter setting at? What's my mic pregame? What's my name that I've assigned to the transmitter? All that metadata gets added for free. It just gets sent back with the transmission scheme. So you're not really using up any extra juice and it's at the receiver. 
But this cross remote capability allows you to control the transmitter from the receiver and even in our shoulder cams, even some of it from our cameras, from the front of the receiver, from the menu of this receiver, from a PC that is controlling, you know, uh, 82 channels of this stuff, from, to a degree, your a cell phone app that we have. And um, in order for this remote control to work, we have to pair up a transmitter with the receiver channel. And we do that one time only. It's sort of like Bluetooth pairing. But this case, in this case, we use what's called 2.4 gig Zigbee. It's a different architecture. It's not quote unquote Wi-Fi. And, and we should talk about um, Zigbee is closer to Bluetooth than it is to Wi-Fi. Meaning, specifically, it's very, very robust in exactly. terms of uh, interference. Exactly. And once they are paired, you can power these on and off, power these on and off. They still recognize each other. So let's do a quick pairing maybe just to show how easy it is. Sure. So what you would do to the, the quick shortcut to pairing, by the way, is instead of going through the menus, you literally hold down the minus button, hold down the minus button and you power the unit on. And now it says scanning. I am discoverable. And then you pick, you put it down, and you pick your, trans, your, your receiver channel, you hold down its minus button. See if you can see that there, it's got a minus button here. And you hold that down, and you hit it on. And now it's scanning, and it's looking for any discoverable transmitters. And it found it, and it's flashing it at you. And if you had multiple ones you happen to have in that mode, you could choose. But you just say select it. And now they're talking to each other. They're sharing information between the two of them. And I can scan now for free frequencies on this receiver. Exactly. And I can even uh, then, through this Zigbee link, mm -hmm. um, change frequencies on the transmitter. Absolutely. So I don't have to deal with IR sync anymore. You can have up to 30 feet away nominally mm -hmm. with a transmitter body pack. But if you notice on the receiver now, Right here is, if you can see, there are two little arrows facing in opposite directions with a little power level. And it's actually the same thing on the transmitter. And that shows that they are paired. So that's kind of, you know, a nice thing. Now, the pairing step, this remote controllability, allows you, like you were just saying, to change the following functions with the transmitter at a distance. So you can obviously scan for a new frequency in about under a half a second, have it rechange the transmitter to that new frequency. You can change up to 15 different low cut filter settings. Uh -huh. You can change mic pregain. You can even change its power output from one to 10 to 50 milliwatts. So in the middle of a shot, you know, you say, um, guys walking far away, you can change that. You can even remotely put the transmitter to sleep. You know, say this is all buried under, you know, like uh, costumes and everything, and it's time for a lunch break. You wouldn't go, uh, excuse me, Miss Streisand, can I reach under your clothes and, and turn off your, you know, save some batteries. But you can do that from the receiver, put this into a low power state so that when you come back, from your break, you can just remotely power it back up and get going again. Fantastic. And uh, also, that all applies to the um, plug-on plug -on as, well. as well. Plug-on uh, well. Now, uh, there's, there's one more thing that I just want to mention. Sure. In our rack receiver, mm -hmm. this is, you know, meant for studio application, for mobile card application, things like that. But um, in that kind of a situation, um, you could envision where you would want many of these receivers hooked up to a closed network so that you know this could be on a network with up to six PCs, one in each different control room, for example, and you could have these receivers all in multiple studios even. But one of the benefits is that remote controllability. So we were saying that you know this and this guy gets you, you know, a 30-foot diameter range, 30 foot radius range, a 60 foot diameter circle of, of coverage. But say you wanted to uh, add to that. Well, we make this guy right here, which is a um, cross remote, can, you can see the side here, it's a cross remote transmission antenna. Mm -hmm. And you can put up to nine of these 
on the network and assign them each their own IP address. And they can be put, and they're even powered over Ethernet. So they can be put in multiple areas of the set or multiple studios or one out on the commons or whatever you want, up and down a hallway, you know, for example, when you have actors going out into the hallway for a bit. And they become a kind of mesh network, is that right? So, the, so that each one adds to yep, the range. Exactly. And it's just, uh, you know, and, and so that can all be on the same network. Now, additionally, on that network, with PCs, with those if you want, you can add a little uh, uh, Wi-Fi router, you know, something you'd buy at, uh, you know, just a, an electronics store for your home, Wi-Fi. And you can then download a free app, iOS or Android, on your phone or tablet. Then you tell your phone or tablet, look and find that Wi-Fi spot, that Wi-Fi access point, run the application, which is free, and it will put up any um, wireless transmitters or receivers that are on the network, and it will even show you ones that are specifically paired, this channel to that channel receiver. They have that cross remote capability. And then through the Wi-Fi app, you can control many of the functions of the transmitter, many of the functions of the receiver. You can rename everything, you can you know, change, you can monitor um, uh, reception strength, you can turn on a uh, signal generator inside of here so you could literally walk around a set and you could look for dips in you know, coverage and, and you could rename antennas. There's, a, there's antennas. A, a waterfall app associated with it, a little on the, on the PC side, is that right? How do you mean a waterfall like app? Like when somebody walks around, can I see where the dips were? Uh, will it record that over? Yes, there is. There's a full graph ability. It's called a chart grapher on the PC. And you don't need the PCs right. to do that phone app, by the way. You can just add you know, one of those Wi-Fi routers to the back of these things. But you can, on an individual channel basis, call up the chart grapher and you can see your A tuner strength, your B tuner strength, the resulting combo diversity reception. You can see a bit stream quality moving graphs. You can see if it took a hit. You can see where the dips are, you know, depending on where the transmitter was. It's, um, it's a very, very powerful system. And, um, you know, we set these down to 10 milliwatts and got all kinds of range at the debates right. and, and it sounded great. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit worried for time. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I would say that really to experience this, um, please call us in New York or Atlanta. We'll arrange for a demo. Um, we want to get the um, digital systems out to our cart users, um, but I either system, we, we um, you know, we're, we're behind. I mean, these, these systems work under really adverse conditions. Um, I also want to say, um, and I'm speeding through it a little bit just in the interest of time, uh, for my CART brothers and sisters, um, a lot of manufacturers say their equipment is meant for use on location. You guys walk the walk and, uh, and talk the talk. Um, there's 12 volts on the back of this. If we had time, we'd flip everything around. But on the rack receiver. On the rack receiver, it is, uh, there's a four pin input. Um, that's, uh, really, that's really great to see. Yeah. Um, and in addition to cascading outputs and, um, you know, so you could build a system. I, of course, I wish it were more than just two channels in Iraq, but I'm happy to see that it's uh, totally wide band. You know, one, one thing that I've been toying with making up is mm -hmm. taking three of these little buckets and tying, th you know, three next to each other with just a connector plate that would, you know, connect between these screws. And then you would have, you know, effectively six channels in a single rack side yeah. by side. Uh, Not bad. So sounds like a, a project that yeah. uh, we could sink our yeah, teeth into. Yeah, I'd love um, to do it. All right. Thank you. Uh, before we before we break away, um, any any questions? Anyone? No, no questions. All right. Um, so these are um, these are available for sale and soon for rent. Um, give us a call, New York or Atlanta. Um, we are are happy to answer your questions, and uh, we want to get these in your hands. Um, as always, you um, can find us on our, our Vimeo and YouTube archives. Um, your ideas, Facebook and Twitter, uh, uh, tweet us uh, your ideas. Um, send them to info at gothamsound.com. Um, Andy, thank you so much for, for hey, coming. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it.